frequency of the Holonet is under imperial control. We will not accept nor tolerate any attempt to commandeer this station by rebel propagandists. Any attempt to commandeer this station will be met with the harshest of punishments. Uh uh, no, no, this is not, a, this, this, you're in the wrong galaxy. This is not your galaxy. This is the International Spy Museum. This is our program on spying in Star Wars. I, I uh, hope you'll stand down or I'm gonna get my Wookiee to come and get you. We well, got Dr. Do. Vince, we got our top officer, Dr. Vince Houghton here. This evening. Well, we thought, we didn't, we didn't mean to, we thought this was a, a different, uh, maybe. Did, oh, did okay. you put the rotation in? I thought, it, I mean, okay, okay it's, so it's we're sorry. Fine. It's fine. We thought this was our station. No it's bad, no bad. It's okay. okay. We're just, we're in a like totally different place, but. Sure, no problem. Yeah, Sorry. all right. Thanks for, thanks for understanding. Really appreciate that. No, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, stay safe. All right, you too. All right, bye. Wear, your, wear your mask. Wear, yeah, wear your mask. Hi, okay. everyone. I'm Amanda bye. Olsey. Bye. Bye, scary empire representatives. I'm Amanda Olkey, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum. May the 4th be with you. We're so excited um, to have Vince Houghton here to give uh, a really tremendous talk. And we also have another guest Star Wars person that will be joining us. Um, Vince has been working like crazy on what he's going to say. And there he is. I also have to show off our super cool new shirt from the Spy Museum store. Gotta, gotta let you know about our merch. And if you're interested in that or other Star Wars stuff that we have, you'll see that in the chat. Vince is our resident Star Wars expert, but I sure like to talk about it with him because I'm a big fan too. So I'm excited and I will disappear for a while then. Thanks, Vince. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome everyone. We actually have a pretty cool uh, event for you today. Uh, not just me, um, I'm always pretty cool. Uh, we have a special surprise in the very beginning. Uh, we have the opportunity to talk to someone who's worked with the museum now for several years and has a very unique perspective, a unique relationship with the Star Wars universe. And in this case, um, he's somewhat, he's our lawyer. Wait, that can't be right. Our, yeah, he's our lawyer. So let's talk to Charles Hildebrandt right now. Let's bring him onto the screen. Obviously a Star Wars fan as well. So Charles, uh, you are the, law the lawyers for the Spy Museum. It is kind of a random occurrence, you, sound. Um, and But you do have one of the most unique experiences with the Star Wars universe of anybody. So tell us a little bit how you were first introduced to the world of Star Wars. Well, I thank you, Vince. Uh, so let me explain that. Um, yes, I am a lawyer and I, am, uh, I have the privilege of representing the International Spy Museum, uh, but my dad, Tim Hildebrandt, was not a lawyer. He was a professional artist and he had a very long career, 40 years, illustrating a little bit of everything from record albums and textbooks and book covers and, of course, movie posters. He was the artist who is responsible for the original 1977 Star Wars movie poster. And so let me tell you a little story about how that came about. Let's roll back to the early years of 1977. I was nine years old. Uh, my dad, who, as I said, had a long career as a, as a science fiction and fantasy artist. He was well known at the time. Uh, and he, uh, in particular, was well known for having done illustrations for uh, The Lord of the Rings, 1970s calendars, uh, along with science fiction book covers and whatnot. Um, in, the er in early in 1977, he got a call from a New York advertising agency asking him to come into the city for a special job. They had a movie poster for him to illustrate. He went into, into the city. We lived about 40 miles outside of New York took the train in and uh, he, he was presented with a job. The job was, well, we got a movie poster for you to do. This wasn't the first time he had done a movie poster, but this was a little unusual because they said, here's the thing. 
this movie is coming out fairly soon. The, the production company is dissatisfied with the current movie poster, and they need a new one quickly. In fact, we'd like it to be tomorrow, if you could do it, as fast as humanly possible. Tomorrow? What are you talking about? No, 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 don't worry about it. This movie is terrible, and no one is ever going to see it. So it doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. Well, what do you know about the movie? Not a lot. They gave him a basic rundown of the plot. Here are some of the characters. And they handed him a stack of 8 by 10 glossy black and white photographs. Yay big. Said, here you go. This is what we know. I sent him home with orders to produce a movie poster in the next, well, ideally a day. All right. The next morning, that happened in the afternoon. And the next morning, my dad was driving me to school. Now, I was nine years old at the time, and I was already a major science fiction and fantasy fan. I, in fact, a few months earlier in 1976, I had already gone to a Star Trek convention, and I had grown up with the Planet of the Apes and Logan's Run, so I was certainly the prime audience for this sort of thing. My dad, as I'm sitting in the car, my dad handed over to me that stack of black and white photos, and I'm looking through them as we're driving. Uh, and yeah, they were photos of stormtroopers in armor, uh, uh, shots of Chewbacca actually being marched to the, uh, to the Death Star. Um, very few effect shots, you know, one of the next wing being chased by a TIE fighter, but uh, mostly just on the set photography and a few publicity stills. And my dad sort of said, you know, Charles, I got this new job. It's a movie poster for a science fiction film. I don't really know much about it. But they have some strange characters in it. There's somebody called Darth Vader. And there's somebody else called Chewbacca. And I don't know. And, and he said, I don't know much about the movie. They told me it's terrible. And I'm looking through the photos and I said, Dad, I don't know. It looks pretty good. I count myself as a very early pro Star Wars critic. All right. So uh, he did poster quickly, uh, working with his brother. The two of them produced it in about 36 hours, actually, from start to finish. What you're seeing on the screen below there are some of the, are two of the original drawings from the 1977 poster. Obviously, not Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill, who, remember, weren't stars and didn't matter. Uh, yeah, and that's the poster that they produced, uh, which everyone has seen since then. Well, off that went. Now, months went by. And uh, my dad and mom and I had mostly forgotten about this little incident uh, until one day a, uh, uh, we got notice that the film was going to premiere in May of 77, and we got tickets to go to the premiere. They sent us four tickets. My mom, dad, and I were three, and we kept one more. Yeah, and that's what they look like. Pretty nice. So. The premiere was in the evening in, in New York City and uh, in a theater that was an absolutely immense thing about three levels down underground below the subways in the middle of Times Square. The theater was actually still operating up until uh, almost 10 years ago. Anyway, um, we all file in and this is the East Coast premiere of the film. And let me explain a little bit of something about that. Back in 1977, things worked differently than they do now. There was no AMC. There was no Regal Cinemas. These giant chains simply didn't exist. Um, if you wanted to show a movie, studios had to make individual deals with theater owners who might own five theaters here or 10 or 20 or 50 or two. Um, and outside of films that were that had major stars in them, you know, known box office quantities, almost nothing was pre-booked. The way it was sold was that the studios would arrange a showing like this for the agents and owners of these theater chains to take a look at and see literally, do you want to take the movie? Here it is, take a look. That's what this showing was. Uh, we were invited, we go in, and um, this is an enormous theater. Uh, uh, one of the largest I've ever seen. It's still one of the largest I've ever seen. Uh, no stadium seating though. The but. When filing into the theater, some, there was something very strange. On every single seat in this enormous movie theater, there was a little booklet sitting on the seat. It was a little booklet that 20th Century Fox had printed up. And it was a pretty extensive description of the Star Wars universe and characters and events, including pronunciation guides for the characters, distributed for everyone. 
these were at the premiere and actually in the first week of release, Fox was still sending these out to theaters because Fox was absolutely terrified about one aspect of this film, well, probably a lot, but certainly one. We don't think about it now, but there was something very strange about Star Wars in 1977. Um, this was the very first major theatrical release of a film that did not take place on Earth or mention Earth or have any connection to Earth. And we don't really think about that now, but it, it was radical. And Fox was convinced that people would just not understand this. That they, that even the concept of a completely fantasy universe would be so alien that they needed literally a book to explain it. Well, I kept that too. Okay, so we sit down to the, in, in this theater, enormous theater, packed with theatrical, New York City area theatrical booking agents. So possibly the most cynical audience imaginable, right? Uh, and this is a premiere. So there are no trailers, there's no, no smoking, there's nothing. The movie just starts. John Williams' music begins. The blockade runner flies over, pursued by the Star Destroyer, and instantly, this massive theater filled with cynical booking agents is captured. You can feel it. Everybody loves this movie from the first moment. And by the end, again, this damn cynical audience is cheering and, and ends with absolute, is applauding the, the movie screen. They all file out of the theater singing John Williams' music. And as we were rising up the, the remember this theater is two levels below the streets and the first escalator is level going up to the second level. So the first one down below the, below the streets, um, there were rows of telephone booths. Uh, let me explain for the younger people in the audience. A telephone booth is kind of like a, a, a public cell phone that's stuck to the wall and you have to pay to use it. Those used to be very common. Anyway, the, the phone booths had lines of the agents in front of them lining up to use the phones. And as I walked by to go up to the next level of the theaters, you, I could hear the agent saying, take it, take it for as many minutes as you want. Take it, take it, take it. Fantastic. Then finally going up to the last series of escalators to the very top, about to exit from the theater, um, the Fox had provided buckets and the ushers were handing out buckets filled with those. May the force be with you buttons. That's another original from literally the premiere in 1977. Um, and away it went. Yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. One of my favorite things that you have, Charles, is um, a signed poster. Uh, right. Where... So that's what's behind yeah. me right there. Um, so obviously, I don't own the original uh, po movie poster that was owned by Fox, but I do have the, the painting, but th I do have that print I'm very proud of because, yes, that's signed by Mark Hamill, and if you can read it, it says, Tim, thanks for the physique. <laughs> yes. was, he had never really seen Mark Hamill's body, and so he gave him like a nine pack and decided no, yeah, to yeah. go with it from there. So you're going yeah, to yeah. also work later on on some of the most iconic stuff, especially for people like me who remember the 90s and a lot of the stuff that came out in between Return of the Jedi right. and the prequels like some of the games right. and like Shadows of the Empire. Right, so, and actually those are some of the originals you see behind me and what's displayed on the screen, exactly. So um, I actually want to point out the one in the upper left-hand corner, which is the, it's a little bit, it's a strange and unusual one, the Ewok getting blasted by the ATST over there. That was a painting that was unused. It was for a completed but unreleased Atari 2600 game from 1983. There's a video game crash in the mid 1980s, and uh, so lots of things, the market sort of collapsed, and a lot of video games that were done and just about to be released never got released. That's one of them right there. Um, folks my age might remember the predecessor game. There was an Empire Strikes Back game that Parker Brothers released, and this was going to be the next one. They never, they never released it. But yeah, so the other photos there, that's just a selection of a much larger number, uh, some of them you see behind me. Uh, from the Shadows of the Empire uh, franchise marketing push from the 1990s, which is exactly as you yeah. said. It was a collection of cards and games and posters and toys and sort of in the lead up to what would eventually become Lucas's next Star Wars push, right. which, you know, of course, was, you know, 
the Phantom Menace at all. So, well, Charles, thank you so <laughs> much for sharing this with us. I mean, it's fascinating to see somebody who was there at the beginning. It was, it was fun. May the force be with you. Yes, as you as well. Thank you so much. So let's talk about what we're going to do today, because this is going to be a bit different than what we've done somewhat in the past. Um, we are in a position where I'm not standing in front of a live audience, which is usually how I do this, usually how I find ways to excel in kind of having a back and forth with an audience. So we're going to do it a little differently. It's going to be obviously all virtual. And I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can so I can get as much as I can in. So I'm going to try to not speak over myself. But at the same time, we are going to talk about where we find intelligence within the Star Wars universe. And, uh, you know, I, my, one of my favorite uh, wonderful photoshops is on the screen now of Princess Leia in front of the Bond car. Because in essence, what we're looking at here is Star Wars as spy movies. And, and you know, that's somewhat controversial. Uh, somewhat uh, interesting to, you know, most people don't agree with me on that one. So we're not going to get into that too, too much today. Instead, we're going to kind of focus on something very specific. In the Star Wars universe itself, we find lots of spying. There are spies everywhere in the Star Wars universe. What we don't see is a lot of intelligence, right? Lots of spies, not a lot of intelligence. And what I mean by that is there are people doing spying. There are people gathering information. There are people out there stealing secrets from their opponent, whether it's the Rebellion or the Empire or the First Order or the, you know, who knows the names at this point anymore? I don't know why they changed from being rebels to the resistance. I don't care. The point is there's spies everywhere, but they're not doing what we consider to be full-fledged intelligence operations. There's not a lot of analysis going on. There's not a lot of collating and processing this intelligence and using it very effectively. So what we're gonna do today is we're actually gonna take several different cases within the Star Wars universe and break them down from the intelligence perspective. These are places and times within the universe where intelligence plays a vital role, but perhaps not as vital as it could have had there been a better setup from you know, the very beginning all the way until the end of the movie series. So we're gonna start essentially with the prequels. And, and this year I'm not ignoring the prequels. So if you like them, you're welcome. Uh, in the years past, I've completely ignored them because I like to pretend they don't exist. But it's hard to do that when you talk about the, the role of intelligence, because in the prequels, you do see a lot of this happening during this time period. So the rise of the empire, the rise of the emperor as a person in charge is, is a really interesting case study in, I would say, the use or the misuse of intelligence. So let's look at intelligence in the old republic. What was it? For the most part, the only bureaucracy that we see, the only intelligence agencies is the Jedi Council. You know, there, there aren't you know, there is no CIA in the old Republic. There is no broad-based intelligence gathering system. It's really the Jedi Council and only the Jedi Council. There's complete centralization there. So the question is, that's fine if they're good, but how good were they? And they thought they were pretty good. I mean, we, we see that there's a real a massive amount of hubris among those in the Jedi Council, where you know, the Sith would not have returned without us sensing it. This is after they see a Sith Lord. So that's a real issue when it comes to the Jedi Council. And then they start to actually kind of second guess themselves a little bit. You know, arrogance is a flaw more and more common among the Jedi, not just the kids, right? This was, you know, Yoda talking to Obi-Wan Kenobi about Anakin, but this is a broad based thing. So this is, should we be kind of paying more attention to what's going on in the world? Now, a real intelligence agency would just sit back on their laurels and assume they know everything. An intelligence agency like the ones in the world today are constantly looking for potential dangers in the world. Their number one job is to warn their governments about potential bad things that could happen to the country. And talk about this as strategic warning or warnings intelligence. And to do so, they actually take things like indications. What could possibly indicate something bad that's happening? What trends can we look at that lead up to potential bad things? So let's kind of take a little bit of a look at what we're talking about in a more common sense and more basic way of understanding strategic warning and trends, because that's really what the Old Republic and the Jedi Council was asked to do. So let's bring this down to a basic level. 
if you see a movie with the wonderful actor Jason Isaacs, right? Talented actor, somebody that pops up in a lot of movies nowadays. That is a trend. We understand a little bit about Jason Isaacs. Even if in the first half of the movie, even if it's a, let's say a rom-com with Meg Ryan, and in the first half of the movie, Jason Isaacs goes around rescuing cute little animals, some kittens and some puppies. And he just, you love Jason Isaacs because he just loves animals. And then halfway through the movie, Jason Isaacs happens to be a cancer doctor and he cures cancer halfway through the movie. You might think Jason Isaacs is gonna be a good guy, but because of trends, because of our understanding of who Jason Isaac is as an actor, we know for a fact by the end of the movie, it's more than likely that Jason Isaacs is gonna be clubbing baby seals because Jason Isaacs is always the bad guy in movies. We don't have to think about this. We just know it when we see it. Now, sorry if I ruined the second season and the first season of Star Trek Discovery for you, but Jason Isaacs is always the bad guy. That's an example from the real world of a trend, something that we can pay attention to to see what's coming in the future. So let's look at what the actual Jedi Council was able to do in the Old Republic. How good were they at this? The answer is putrid. They were terrible at using intelligence to their benefit. The Trade Federation, the separatist movement, the council that provided financial backing was completely misunderstood by the Jedi Council. They thought they were a one-off. They didn't expect they were gonna come with the kind of forces that they did. So they left areas, particularly Naboo, totally undefended, right? If it wasn't for the fact that the Gungan were there, which the first and the last time I'm gonna say, good job Gungan. If it wasn't for the fact that we were there, there would have been real problems. And it's likely that not only Queen Amidala, but Naboo would have fallen completely and stayed fallen because of the ineptitude of the Jedi Council in predicting what was happening. But that's fine, that's a one-off. We can forgive them for missing one thing that comes out of the blue. Remember, there had been peace for decades by this time. In the intelligence world, we talk about this as a black swan, something that comes out of nowhere and surprises us. That's fine. But then you stab the sudden appearance of a Sith. All of a sudden, there's Darth Maul fighting against the Jedi. This by itself, if it was independent of everything else, would also be an unexpected thing out of the past. But combined with what the Trade Federation was doing, these start to add up as trends, as indicators of something bigger brewing. Then you get Count Dooku and getting the outer regions of the galaxy coordinated together to fight against the Old Republic. Yet another trend where it's not just a one-off with the Trade Federation. It's not just a one-off with Darth Maul. You now have someone like Count Dooku and people out there that the Sith movement is getting bigger and bigger. And this is something that should be paid attention to. Now, something that looks good for the Jedi Council at one point should have actually given them real pause. And that's the fact that there's a clone army that they knew nothing about that magically appears. And yeah, it's great. It helps them to fight the Clone Wars, but they didn't know it existed in the first place. This should have caused them to have a real hardcore come to Jesus moment or come to the force moment to say, okay, what are we missing? How are we missing all these things? We need to reestablish some understanding of what's going on in the world. And of course, because they knew nothing about the clone army, they knew nothing about the fact that they were programmed with Order 66, which would eventually be their downfall. And of course, the biggest of all of these is the complete inability to figure out that Palpatine was the bad guy. The fact he's right under their noses the entire time. He's able to completely manipulate what's going on in the Old Republic to the point where he's named Chancellor and then Emperor and all of this right under the nose of Yoda and Mace Windu and the rest of the Jedi Council. Now, the one thing they do is to send a spy in to try to figure out what Palpatine is up to. But if you think about this in a kind of governmental political way, they send a spy to spy on the senior civilian authority. It's like if the CIA sent in someone to spy on the president. Now, you can deep state this all you want to, but there's not somebody at CIA who's infiltrated the White House. This is what banana republics do. You know, We're not in one of those countries quite yet. So we're in a position where there's not a whole lot going on that's going right for the Jedi Council and their ability to do intelligence. But at this point, let's actually look at the spy they sent in in the first place. Probably not who I would have sent in. Anakin Skywalker, he's certainly a Jedi, but not a master, and that causes certainly problems. He has zero intelligence training. 
This is not someone who has gone through a school like the farm. This is not someone who even knows what to look for. This is not someone that has been trained in cover or trained in how to be deceptive. Actually, by definition, the Jedi are actually supposed to be kind of forthright and non-deceptive. This is somebody who is already at the precipice of being turned to the dark side. And it's not like that comes out of the blue because the Jedi Council is very wary of all the fear and hate inside of him. So why put him as the guy right next to the Chancellor to get turned? And of course, he's turned immediately, all right? Anakin is the worst spy in history, not named Nathan Hale. He is turned immediately. He actually does discover that the Emperor is the bad guy, but it's because the Emperor literally tells him that he's proficient in the dark side of the arts. It's not that Anakin figured this out. It's not that this is something that they were able to, you know, to, to figure out by secret documents or by, you know, eavesdropping in on the Emperor's conversation. No, the Emperor came right out and said, hey, I'm the bad guy. So the report card is really an F, right? If the old Republic had decided to establish a well-regulated intelligence agency, they might not have been an empire in, in any way, shape, or form. Let's look at what happens next, the rise of the rebellion. The empire is in place, and I, got, I had to give Porkins some shout out here because he's never gonna get it otherwise. The empire is in place, and all of a sudden the rebellion comes out of nowhere, you know, or at least you would think it would come out of nowhere. Now, this was a massive intelligence failure, as we just talked about, on the part of the old republic. Now, when intelligence failure happens, regardless of who it is, good intelligence agencies around the world study it. They try to understand why it took place so they don't make the same mistakes themselves. This is not something that is unheard of in the Star Wars universe. We actually see Yoda talking about this. Failure is the greatest teacher, right? That's how we understand what not to do moving forward. And in the real world, Agencies do this all the time. In the United States, we've done this on several occasions, after Pearl Harbor, after 9-11, and all the time. Actually, CIA has a journal called Studies in Intelligence that constantly is going through events in the past to try to understand them better so that we're, in the future, are better prepared to deal with whatever comes our way. The problem we run into is that we don't necessarily see this happening very often in the Star Wars universe. The Empire should have taken the lessons learned from the fall of the Republic and applied them, but they don't. They actually fall into some of the same traps that the old Republic does. What is the bureaucracy? Is there an imperial intelligence apparatus, an agency? Is there a imperial CIA? Well, who knows? We don't see it, right? It's certainly not in the movies, maybe in the extended universe. We, we hear a little bit about it, but as far as what we can tell, it's not there. Darth Vader does some of this. He's particularly adept at counterintelligence or arguably maybe he is and maybe he's not, but he seems to be the main guy on counterintelligence. But we know for a fact that the empire has a real problem with things like tactical and military intelligence. They don't really understand their opponent very well. They don't understand what threat their opponent possesses. What are our tactical weaknesses? Look, they build the Death Star. They build these massive star destroyers. What's the point of that? The idea behind that is to fight other massive fleets in space, right? Well, there is no massive fleet in space. They're a non-peer situation. It's not like the United States and Russia or the Soviet Union. That was a pure-peer relationship. Yes, you build big aircraft carriers because you're going to be fighting naval battles on the sea. But all the rebellion can produce, except for a couple capital ships, is these small single pilot fighters. Well, we know from watching the history of this, that these single fighters are horribly uh, matched against Star Destroyers when they go head to head. Of course, they're outgunned in every way, but because they're so fast, they're so small, they're so maneuverable, they're able to get inside the radius of the Star Destroyers and certainly able to get knee deep inside the Death Star. You actually hear them talking about, we never really anticipated going up against these small fighters. How? How did you not anticipate that? Right? It's all the rebellion has. This is very, very bad tactical intelligence. And then we talked about centralization with the Old Republic and how the Jedi Council really dooms them. Well, it's even more so when we look at the Empire. Everything is centralized. 
you don't have stations throughout the galaxy collecting information for you. In the United States, the CIA has stations in countries around the world. That's so we can pick up information that's going on in different places. There are CIA stations almost in every single country that we have a diplomatic relationship with, and even some that we don't. When you don't have this, you can't see what's coming. You have no idea except when it gets right up on top of you. And at this point, it's impossible to hunt down the remnants of the old Republic. There's still people out there. Yoda has escaped. Kenobi has escaped. You don't know where these people are that are eventually going to form the rebellion. I mean, put a station on Tatooine, right? Why not have a group of intelligence officers on Tatooine? It's the home of Darth Vader. His extended family is still there. If every so often someone went by that extended family, that moisture evaporator out in the middle of the Tatooine desert, maybe you would have run into a kid named Luke Skywalker. That might have changed the course of the movie series just a little bit if a five-year-old Luke was discovered by the Empire and they took him out then. Or a couple blocks away, you've got the guy with the worst cover in the history of intelligence, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I, I can imagine the conversation. You know, oh, Obi-Wan, you got to go into hiding, you know, so the Empire doesn't find you. He's like, oh, I got it. I got it. I've got a great cover name. I'm going to go by Ben. Oh, okay. What do you mean? Like, like you know, Ben Gunderson or Ben Antilles? No, no. Ben Kenobi. I'm not sure you understand how this whole secret cover thing works. It's like if the CIA had gone to the compound on Abbottabad, Pakistan, and after doing some real deep digging, come back and saying, uh, we got the wrong place. It, it, the guy says his name is Frank bin Laden, not Osama bin Laden. So it's close. We, we almost had the right guy, but really back to the drawing board, right? That, that's how ridiculous that we're talking about here. Imperial intelligence also fails in a massive way in counterintelligence. And this is quite obvious from you know, what you see in the very underrated Rogue One, where they have their top scientists working on the most important technological advancement in Imperial history, and he's a spy. And he's someone passing along information to his own daughter, which allows the rebellion to do everything they're supposed to do. I mean, that's that's pretty problematic. Now we talked about Vader, and Vader does hold his own to a degree when it comes to doing counterintelligence himself. And let's profile one of our main spies for the rebellion in this case, and that's Leia. Vader realizes who Leia is. You know, you're a member of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor, right? So he wasn't completely fooled by our heroine spy here. Let's take a little bit longer look at Leia, because Leia has an interesting backstory when it comes to her abilities as a spy. She has what we call official cover. This is when you are put in a position where you're pretending that you are a member of the State Department or a member of the, like the United States government in this case, when you're actually working for, let's say, the CIA. You're working at an embassy overseas. You're pretending that you're the second deputy agricultural attache at that embassy, when in essence, you're a CIA officer. For Leia, she is a member of the Imperial Senate. That is her cover when in, in essence, she is actually a spy for the rebellion. Now, there's another spy for the rebellion that we need to talk about. We're gonna talk about the difference between the two. Of course, Cassian Andor is actually the only person in the entire universe that is called an intelligence officer. He is an intelligence officer for the rebellion. But unlike Leia, who has official cover as a member of a legitimate government, we have Cassian Andor as what's called a knock, non-official cover. That's what we say here in the United States. In Russia, they're called illegals. What this means is this is not somebody who has diplomatic immunity. This is not somebody who is protected by the government or the State Department. This is someone who's pretending to be something completely different than a government agent. And that's where we're seeing these two spy differences here. Let's take a second to talk about counterintelligence, because counterintelligence is a key component to what we see here in the Star Wars universe. What we try to do in counterintelligence is to understand motivations, why people would be willing to spy. What would make someone be willing to turn traitor against their own country? What would, it, would be enough to make you decide that you wanted to sell out your friends and family and fellow country people? The acronym that's been used for quite some time 
to talk about these motivations is MICE, not, not that mouse, Mickey. The MICE is actually an acronym that describes specifically what kind of motivations may cause someone to spy. And the cool thing about MICE is that we see all of it within the Star Wars universe. So the M stands for money. Now there are multiple times within the Star Wars universe that we see money being passed for information. Everything from money being given to the spy at the very beginning at Mos Eisley Spaceport when, when Han and Luke and, and, and Ben Kenobi are escaping to the most famous where DJ seems to be someone that is helping the, the, the I would call, I call it the rebellion, but the resistance. And in the end, he sells them out uh, and tells the um, first order that they're up to something. And money didn't, I mean, he seemed like he got paid a lot of money, but money is something that turned him against the people who he supposedly was helping. And money arguably is the most common today of the different motivations that lead people to do spying. Talking people paying millions of dollars in order to basically become a traitor against their country. Now the I in mice is ideology. We've already kind of talked about the ideological spy. In this case, Galen Erso is the perfect example of the person who decides to go against his country, and his country in this case is the empire, because he truly believes what he's doing is right. He believes that the side facing against his country is the side that he wants to fight for. And ideological spies, they, they don't pop up all that often anymore. In some cases, you see them in counterterrorism, where former terrorists decide they don't want to be uh, an extremist anymore. Ideological spies were very common in the 1930s when the Soviet Union looked as though it was a utopian state that everyone wanted to be part of. And so a lot of the people who went on the spy for the Soviet Union in the 40s and the 50s were ideologically driven by a really bad belief in communism. C stands for either compromise or coercion. It really depends on who you ask. And really the most famous instance of this in the Star Wars universe is good old Lando Calrissian, who is supposedly going to help Han, Leia, and crew, but before they arrive in Cloud City, has been compromised by the Empire. They basically threaten him that if he doesn't help to work against the rebels, that his life would end and they take over the Cloud City at Bespin. Uh, and this is something that uh, forces him, at that point at least, to go against the rebels. In real life, this doesn't happen very often. It's very difficult to do this well. Most of the time, blackmailing someone to spy for you is not that effective. It's really, if you talk about the carrot versus stick approach, the carrot works much better. Pay them off. Try to get them to be ideologically in tune with your ideas, or you could actually go with the last one. And the last one is one that I was kind of holding my breath because we had 10 Star Wars movies without an example of the E in mice. I'm like, man, if we go all the way through the whole series without the E in mice, I'll be a little annoyed. But it, true to form, Star Wars does not disappoint because the E in mice stands for ego. And there's nothing more wonderful for me, certainly somebody who's trying to put together a program like this, than when General Hux in his whiny voice yells out, I am the spy. Great, Hux, you're the spy. Why? And then later on, very soon, we find out he doesn't care about the rebellion or the resistance. He doesn't care about the empire. He doesn't need money. He's not ideologically driven or he's not compromised. He just hates the fact that Kylo Ren is in charge and he's not. His ego is so weakened by the threat of Kylo Ren that he's willing to turn against the empire. And ego is a very strong force. Some of the most damaging spies in American history were driven by ego. A couple of weeks ago, we talked to Eric O'Neill about Robert Hansen. Yes, he was paid a lot of money, but ego really drove him much in the same way that it drove General Hux. So let's shift our focus beyond the ego side to looking at a, pretty, a specific battle. In this case, the Battle of Hoth. So this is the battle that takes place at the very beginning of Empire Strikes Back. This is a battle where there is a lot of possible tactical intelligence that we can talk about. One of the most interesting things about the Battle of Hoth is the real missed opportunity that happens because of the inability of the Empire to follow through on their intelligence collection. 
they actually do a very good job in sending a probe droid down the Hoth that finds out that, hey, look, this is where these guys are, right? They're here, right? We found that there is a, a shield generator here on the Hoth. Clearly, there's bad guys here, the Rebellion, because the, the probe itself was destroyed, but they only send one. There's no follow-on effort to learn more about the topography of Hoth. There's no follow-on effort to learn more about the status of forces of the rebel. What weapons do they have? What defenses are there? Yes, they've got a shield, but how many men? Are there ships? Are there possible problems arriving on the scene? And of course, because they don't do this, they miss the key piece of information that changes the battle completely. And that's not, that shouldn't be that hard to miss. It's ginormous. It's a massive ion cannon. That's what allows the rebels to actually win the Battle of Hoth. Now, I know at the end, they lose their base. I know at the end that a lot of people were killed and the Adats were able to get all the way there and they're able to go, go into the base. But the whole point of the Battle of Hoth was a delaying action. The whole idea was to slow down the empire so that the rebels could evacuate and move on to somewhere else. Well, that was a success. And it's only a success because of the ion cannon because the ability to fire that into space and then knock out the Star Destroyers to allow the people to escape. If they had sent multiple droids down to find out what was going on, they could have targeted that ion cannon instead of the shield generator and prevented anyone from escaping. This is a massive intelligence failure for the Empire. They could have ended everything right there because without the ion cannon, no one can escape, but they only send one droid there's also the issue of the decision to make a frontal assault on the Hoth base. Now, this doesn't turn out badly for the Empire because they do end up getting into the base, but it could have if anyone had a clue what they were doing on the Rebel side. Adats were not brand new to the Star Wars universe. The Rebels had dealt with them before. I don't know why they were so surprised during the Battle of Hoth that the snow speeder blasters could not penetrate the frontal armor of the ADATs. Regardless, they should not be flying right at the, the ADATs from the front anyway, because that's where the guns are. If the rebels were smart, and thankfully for the Empire they weren't, they would have just flown around behind the ADATs and shot them from the rear and stayed out of the gun range. They don't do this, and that almost you know, destroys them in the process. But fortunately, uh, both sides really had bad tactical intelligence at this point, and the battle happens the way that it actually did. Another battle that geospatial intelligence, that's the, the term that we use to talk about the inability to understand the terrain, the population, uh, what you're dealing with when you move into an environment, is a battle of Endor. This is much more of a failure on one side versus the other. Now, we'll talk about this in a second. Yes, the Empire really fails in understanding the geospatial intelligence of the battle space. They, they bring in the ATST walkers. They don't do all that well, as we'll see against a forested area. But the real failure here is actually on the side of the rebels. They get intelligence that the shield generator is, is from this moon. They know they have to go down and destroy it. They know that it's wooded in some way, but they do no preparation of the space. They don't send anyone down to determine what possible obstacles might they run into or what possible alliances could they strike with any indigenous personnel. On the, on the land. And of course, in this case, we're, we're talking about the significant failure of doing geospatial intelligence for both sides. And of course, in this case, this is because the rebels fail miserably to determine that there is a indigenous force on the planet that really delays their ability to pull off their mission. You can imagine what would happen if it wasn't for the luck of a C-3PO or if Leia had not been taken earlier, Han, Luke, and crew would have been eaten by the Ewoks. But even more importantly, this was an opportunity for the rebellion that they pass up. Remember the fact that when the fleet appears in the space above, it's just at the nick of time that the rebels were able to destroy the actual shield. But if they had known the Ewoks were there, if they had done this kind of research and intelligence, they would have discovered that these guys didn't like the Empire all that much themselves. They could have sent teams down to recruit them, much in the same way that a special forces team 
recruits indigenous personnel to fight against people we don't like. Essentially, this is what the Green Berets do. In this case, you could have convinced the Ewoks to fight with you from the very beginning. They could have shown you the back door to the shield generator from the get-go. You never would have had to deal with the kind of crazy that you dealt with beforehand. And in fact, the, the rebels are really lucky they were able to pull this thing off in the end. And really, they're able to pull this off because of the inability of the empire to really understand what they were dealing with the battle space. Of course, you know, woods, rocks, logs, all these things that are used against them that they did not foresee as being a potential hazard going into this battle. This was not something they expected against, um, the, you know, it's as indigenous personnel that had no technology whatsoever. This is not a good way to fight a war. You know, you don't want to go into somewhere where you have no idea what you're dealing with and find out that you're outmanned, you're outgunned, whether it's guns or not. In this case, you're out tree trunked by your, your opponent. And all it takes is a little bit of help from trained soldiers to get you to that point. One thing that I think is really interesting from a tactical perspective is there is a dramatic difference in what's going on tactically between the rebels and between the empire. And so let's break out really quickly and let's talk about a key concept that has seemed to be ignored by the empire. In this case, it's camouflage. Now, what is the purpose of camouflage? The purpose of camouflage, not is just to hide something. It's actually to, to trick the brain into not seeing what's directly in front of you. For instance, let's take a look at Clint here. So Clint's a great example. He actually does a decent job you know, for the movies of putting camouflage on his face. Our normal face, the face that we've known since we were babies, we recognize light hitting certain areas of our face, our nose, our chin, our cheekbones, our forehead. So what you wanna do when you camouflage is put those dark paints, like the blacks and the dark browns and greens on those areas, our nose, our chin, our cheekbones, our forehead. In the lighter colors, on the places that are naturally darker in natural light. So that when our face looks at a face that is camouflaged, our eyes look at a face that's camouflaged, our brain is confused. It sees the light that's supposed to be dark, it sees the dark that's supposed to be light, and it's something that we really don't understand from that perspective. This is what's done with people, this is what's done with vehicles, in this case, you're changing the silhouette of this Challenger 2 tank, the British main battle tank, by putting like leaves type structure on the outside of it. It's called a camo net. It's what's done in ships. In this case, a dazzle ship uh, from both World War I and World War II, where you, the natural outline of the ship is not apparent because of the paint scheme that's put on there. What we're doing is we're tricking the brain. Now, we know that stormtroopers understand this concept. We know that this is not completely foreign in the Star Wars universe, because when the clone troopers went to the Battle of Kashyyyk, which is the Wookiee homeworld, they wore camouflage to actually blend them into the surroundings. So it's not like this concept is not part of the Star Wars universe. Yet, when we see the Battle of Endor, they're the easiest thing in the world to possibly spot. They're right there. They're wearing all white. They're impossible to miss. I mean, this is something that is just pretty extraordinary that they're wearing this kind of outfit. I mean, think about the concept of, you know, fighting in a jungle. Number one, these suits have to be hot as all get out, but we know they don't protect them against laser blasts. The helmets aren't there to protect them against getting shot. That goes right through. So what are they there for? They're there for rocks or other things, but why make them bright white? Honestly. My, my, our buddy, Mike Mincy, who works in our AV department, photoshopped a bunch of this stuff for me, and he actually made a Stormtrooper uniform that would have been more camouflaged in the kind of environment on Endor. And it's so ridiculous, but this would actually made them harder to spot. That's how bad white is when it comes to fighting these kind of battles, right? This is just a tactical disadvantage at the hands of the Empire. Finally, let's take a look at the real beautiful deception operation that is the, the second Death Star battle. Now, deception's been around in intelligence work since the beginning of time. You know, th there have been some extraordinary deception operations. Genghis Khan, for one, was a, a genius at deception. In World War II, Operations Bodyguard and Fortitude, 
were genius in uh, deception operations to help the Allies invade Europe, battle Normandy. The Emperor in his deception operation has to go down as one of the all-time greats. Forget the ending, all right? We're not going to figure out, you know, how good the deception operation is by the outcome, because the outcome has nothing to do with how effective the deception operation was. It was great, right? The Emperor laid everything out for the rebellion, and the rebellion fell for it, passed along the information, leaked it out, let them think that the, the new Death Star was not operational, let them think that they had a chance to end the war all at once. And in fact, they come and they almost end up losing the entire rebellion at the time. Now, of course, all this was done through our spy, the Bothans. So the next spy profile kind of focus in on them. I'll give you a second. We know nothing about the Bothans. We know the Bothans just from our understanding that they have spy networks and that a lot of them died. What's interesting though, is that a lot of them died. This just shows how good this deception operation was. You really wanna to try to sell it by making it not look too easy for the, the rebels. Because if it looks like they're getting this information too easily, then they may not fall for the deception. And in many cases, this is what we call a dangle. So let's take a look quickly at this concept of a dangle because that's what we're seeing here by the emperor. So what is a dangle? And in some cases, a dangle is used in, 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 in intelligence operations today, like things to, underco to, to try to discover undercover intelligence officers. You, you say, I've got information to pass along to you. I wanna meet with one of your spies. And then the person who shows up, you might have suspected that they're an intelligence officer, but remember they're the second deputy agricultural attache. But of course, when they show up to try to recruit you, you know for a fact that they work for CIA. Sometimes this is used to collect intelligence. If you're dangling yourself, you might be able to find out from the person who recruits you what information they need, where their gaps are in their intelligence, you know, where, what information they're seeking. But most importantly, in this case, dangles are used to pass disinformation, right? You pretend that I've been recruited and then I pass along bad stuff that gets you to do things that I want you to do. Now, we call this bad information chicken feed. Sometimes chicken feed has genuine information that's not really seriously damaging. It's intelligence that's provided to an enemy that lets them know or lets them think at least that I'm real, that I'm, I'm not actually a bad guy. In this case, the chicken feed that's fed to the Balthans is that the emperor would actually be at the second Death Star. This is true, right? This is not bad information. And this is information that really draws in the guys. It's also the location of the shield generator, right? That there is a shield generator on Endor. That's what's providing the shield for the Death Star. That information is real, but of course it's a trap. So what it does is it sucks people in. It's incomplete information, right? It's not enough to know that, hey, there's a whole legion of troops protecting the shield generator. Or yeah, the Empire's on the Death Star, but it's fully functional. Right? You don't give them that information, but it's just true enough to suck these people in. And then we see the true battle in this case. The reason that it's won is because the, the, the rebels approach this battle in what we call a hybrid warfare status. The assault on the Death, that second Death Star only works. The deception only fails because of a multitude of things that come together in conjunction to help the rebels win this war. First is a very classic false flag operation. This is the Imperial transport, the shuttle that's being used to infiltrate people on Endor, right? It's literally a false flag operation. They are in a ship pretending that they are of another country. Uh, you may have heard that term false flag before. It actually comes from the pirate days where pirates used to raise the flag of the ship they were about to attack. Let's say they attack a British warship or a British merchant ship. They would raise the Union Jack as though they too were a British ship, and then they would get close and lower it and then raise the Jolly Roger and then blast away at the ship and take all the stuff from them. In this case, the rebels are pretending that they're an Imperial shuttle. You also see a false flag operation in Rogue One. So this is something that happens actually much more in the Star Wars universe than happens in the real universe. Admiral Akbar in this case leads the conventional forces, which is one of the elements of a hybrid warfare scenario. 
with Lando leading and the Millennium Falcon, of course. And then you have the special operations forces on the ground, which is Han, Leia, Luke, Chewie, the droids, and then the gorillas. And in this case, finally, thank God, miracle, they're able to recruit the Ewoks by accident in many respects to fight for them on the ground. None of this happens if it wasn't for that. Now, why am I showing you this? Why am I laying out this battle? Because all of this stuff needs to happen perfectly in order for the Emperor's deception not to work, right? It works if unless all of this stuff happens perfectly. That's why I say this is one of the greatest deceptions, I would say, in history, um, but that we can possibly look at. Because if it wasn't absolutely perfect in the sense of what happens with the rebels, the rebellion is completely crushed at this point. So let's go back to our initial question, and then I'll open it up for questions from you. Star Wars or Spy Wars? Who needs the Force when you've got good intel? Well, the answer, we don't know, right? Because we don't have good intelligence in the Star Wars universe. We have a lot of spies, but not a lot of good intelligence. In the end, a lot of the Force is what's necessary, right? The Force helps the Rebels defeat the Emperor and with the second Death Star. The Force allows kind of the old republic to hang on much longer than they should have otherwise because they're able to send jedi in to beat up on some bad guys and the force of course allows luke to defeat the first death star when technology fails him and when he really should have been destroyed beforehand right so the answer in the case is i don't know right maybe one day we'll find out uh when good intelligence enters the star wars universe somewhere but for now the force is all we got amanda I'm coming. Hi, I'm back. Hi, we've had really some great comments behind the scenes. Thank you, Vince. Wow, I know you raced through all of Star Wars. You, you, told, me, you, told, you told me I had to be done by 6.30 for questions. Yeah, I, so. I did. I'm so mean. I'm so mean. But it's because we want to get questions and we want to get people able to return to their non-lives. Um, I really enjoyed this question. Is it possible the Empire only sent one droid because they didn't think Hoth was worth the effort? Well, it's certainly true at the beginning, right? I mean, the idea is that you're sending droids all over the place, and you have no idea that Hoth is going to be a possibility. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's surrounded by an asteroid belt. It's chosen wisely by the rebels. But once it's destroyed, once you actually have the imagery, and this is imagery intelligence that Vader takes one look at, and goes, that's them, that's where they are. You want to prepare the battle space, right? There's kind of a fancy terminology there. But at that point, you send everything you got in there to do reconnaissance for you, right? You send 100 probe droids. They already know you're coming, right? Find out everything. How many men do they have? What kind of defenses are there? What are their escape routes? All the kind of things that you need to do in order to defeat them on site. They don't do any of that. And so, yeah, you're, the person that asked that question is absolutely right. Hoth is just a brick of ice but once you know they're there do something about it right you don't just leave it to say hey let's see what happens when we get there that's not the way you actually want to fight that battle and the same person also thought you know does the empire sound a little like the british during the american revolution to you i mean a little bit i mean the americans during the american revolution actually had a competent intelligence organization right they recruited americans like benedict arnold and others to give them information. They actually understood where Washington was and what Washington was doing. So the empire is not even anywhere near as good as the British were during that time period. Uh, they just, they kind of go in with the flow. Um, and this really comes down to hubris, right? I mean, it, it, the British understood uh, very much so that they were in trouble. Uh, maybe not right away, but they understood they were at the end of their supply line, that they had a big population that was against them during the American Revolution. Um, the better analogy is probably the British in Afghanistan in the 19th century, mm. right? They were fighting a bunch of ragtag people who they thought they would overwhelm with just sheer force and sheer Britishness. And they really just didn't take them for, for they took for granted the, the fact that they were going to win. And as we know, no one wins in Afghanistan, right? The Alexander the Great tried it, the British Empire tried it, the Russians tried it, we tried it. Um, you know, by the time we went in, we should have known any better. But that's an aside. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I think the empire had some serious hubris uh, and considered the rebellion not to be worth their time until it was way too late. 
Um, this is a very cool question. Um, how much of a weakness was the Jedi Enlightenment in contributing to their destruction? It seems that intelligence is a world where that kind of pacifism is a fatal flaw. That's very thoughtful. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd think so. I mean, but the idea is if the Jedi are supposed to, in many cases, have visions of the future, right? I mean, that's, that is about as good as it gets when it comes to in the intelligence world, right? If you can actually have visions of the future, which happens in a lot of cases uh, with the Jedi, then you're good to go. What really needed to happen in this case was that the Jedi needed to understand they had limitations. And you're right, this might have been one of their most important limitations. And the great system would have been if the old Republic as an institution had created an intelligence arm, right? Made up of non-Jedis, made up of professional intelligence officers who could work with the Jedi and say, all right, look, we, we think we've got something here. Maybe we send you guys in to kind of figure out what's going on, but we're collecting, we're analyzing, we're disseminating intelligence to the civilian infrastructure in order to make better decisions, right? Maybe they would have understood what was happening on Naboo because the Jedi sure as hell didn't. Maybe they would have seen Darth Sidious coming, you know, as Palpatine because certainly no one else did. Um, and that's where I, I think that kind of a hybrid system, if you're gonna have the Jedi, that's great, right? That's the, those are special operations forces. Those are, you know, your top intelligence officers, but you need to have analysts, right? You need to have people who are doing you know, science and technology. You need to have the grunts in the background in order to be successful. I mean, we learned that the hard way also in World War II with the OSS. Um, you know, we, we had these guys gallivanting all over Europe, not doing much of anything, and then realized that there needs to be an infrastructure, right? There needs to be a partnership between your James Bond types and your, you know, people who sit back behind a computer. Um, so I, um, I like this. Based on the solo movie, which I finally got to see last weekend, and I I really liked it so much. Um, and this is a, a excellent question. It seems like the Empire has very lax background checks for recruitment or conscription that could easily allow large scale infiltration on backwater planets. So yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I think that's that's one of the interesting things is. Um, and this is not completely unheard of too. When you, when you have massive buildups of certain governmental systems, the United States during World War II ran into this problem. And I think that might be what they're kind of stealing this from is all these new organizations that were being built when the war happened, when the United States joined the war, they doubled, tripled, quadrupled, quintupled in size. And unlike today where a background check for top secret clearance could take you two years, they had to fight a war, right? They had to get these people involved yeah. immediately. And so a lot of people who would turn out to be spies later on infiltrated some very important American government institutions. The empire is in somewhat the same respects. They, it's not necessarily that the rebellion is all that big by the time Solo you know, is, is based, but they're starting to realize they don't have the manpower to govern these outer worlds. So they actually need to increase the size of their army dramatically in order to maintain this empire. And so they're less likely to take the time to look into who's actually signing up. They're much more likely to say, yeah, come on in, you're able-bodied, we'll, we'll work you into shape however we need to. And of course, that's how Han you know, gets his job. But in the end, even if you do infiltrate at that level, you're just kind of a peon, and right. maybe you can work your way up the ranks, but it looks like the life expectancy of a low-level Imperial soldier is not very long. So I'm not sure how high you could get. I'd be much more worried about people coming in at the bureaucratic side. I know that's not very sexy, right? I know people like, you know, hey, yeah, you're a, you're a government worker. But the government workers in, let, let's say, the Imperial State Department or the Imperial Treasury Department may be able to pass along secrets and move up at the ranks much faster than someone in the military. Now, here's someone who's really playing into, um, into our wheelhouse and kind of, as, believe it or not, even as comprehensive as you are, um, they want to know about the different types of intelligence playing in. Like, where's the OSINT in Spy oh, Wars? Yeah. Where's the ELINT? I, I, I love that. Yeah, it's all over the place. I mean, and that's where um, in talks I've done in the past, I've really kind of systematically worked through the yeah. different ends. And that was, you know, again, you can blame Amanda. Uh, and, you know, and COVID 
for the fact that we're not doing that this time. Yeah, because it, it would have been much more difficult to do in this form. Every int is represented. I mean, obviously there's humans, but there's signals intelligence all over the place, intercepting enemy communications. The rebellion is doing it. The empire is doing it. You can see it in all the movies. Um, one that pops in my head the most is uh, the in Rogue One. Uh, they did not send back Gil and Urso's message over the channels because they were deep inside Imperial space. They were worried it would be intercepted. So you see signals intelligence. Obviously, there's things like over, imagery intelligence, geospatial intelligence, image all over the place. When you talk about the probe droid and the shield generator, Massent, measurements and signatures intelligence. This is something that uh, back in the 70s, when Star Wars was made, we weren't really thinking, we, I mean, this is very science fiction, like looking down, oh, I don't really read any life forms down on that planet. Well, we can do things like that now, uh, particularly with things like spectroscopy and seismology where we're looking at things that you just can't see with the naked eye or hear. Uh, everything from, uh, man, the, the most, the oh my God, I wish we had done things differently for the Empire is when the escape pod was launched out of the, the Tantive 5, the blockade runner Tantive 4, uh, and with 3PO and R2 on it with the plans of the Death Star. And there was a gunner on the Star Destroyer who was gonna blast it, but he's like, oh, there's no, there's no life forms on it, let it go, it must be a malfunction. If they had just blown that thing up, R2 and the plans go with it, and there's no serious. Uh, but that was an example of Massant. So uh, you see all the different ints within the Star Wars universe. Uh, and there's even analysis, and there's dissemination, there's all those things as well, just not what's as- the, What's uh, the open? Well, I mean, open that source, yeah. yeah. What's that? That one's trickier, I'm, I'm running it through my head. Well, I mean, open source is something where you're kind of, you're not necessarily learning secrets, right? I mean, that's the key to the open source. Is it's but not I don't secret see them with their newspaper or their news feed open or... Well, I mean, a lot of time open source is also rumors, so rumor intelligence. So you're picking up rumors from around places. You're hearing news from is around... Is that all places. those bar room scenes? Sure, right? Every time you have a cantina and there's information being passed along, you know, that's that kind of stuff. Uh, anytime you have a situation where people are kind of wandering around, you're able to pick up, hey, there's 10 stormtroopers, right? That's open source, that's not secret information. They're walking right there. Um, I'm trying to think of the Mandalorian too, because that series has so much in it that can be used for intelligence also. But there's a lot of things that they just pick up as they're walking around, certainly within the Bounty Hunter Guild, but also within cantinas. That's just not secret, right? That's what open source is, that the open word is meaning mm -hmm. that it's not secret information. So if you're picking things up, through the grapevine and through just being in a, in a city, that's an example of open source. Cool. Um, here's one that you you wish you could say yes to. Um, have you had conversations with George Lucas about the lack of intelligence in the movies? Uh, well, it, George would not be the one I would talk to now, right? I mean, it, you know, uh, if I had a conversation with George Lucas, that would not be the first thing I would bring up. I would I would have a con long conversation about the prequels. Um, and uh, he would not be very happy with me. Um, and then, of course, Han shot first would be the second thing we'd talk about. But uh, no, I mean, I think that one of the interesting things is that it seems as though the people that are running the shows now, and I don't mean J.J. Abrams, I'm talking about what we're seeing from The Mandalorian and what we're seeing moving forward, have a broader appreciation of kind of reality um, in this situation. And, and, and maybe we'll start seeing more of they're slower, right? That's one of the th great things about a show like The Mandalorian is that it's episodic, right? It's it's not a two-hour movie. It ends up being a 12-hour series, and there's a second season to where you can talk about bureaucracy. It's not as sexy, but it's very important. And that's not. And so I don't blame Lucas for this because the only movies in real life that do a good job depicting intelligence tend to be six hours long, and they put even me to sleep, right? So. And then that, and that's that's hard to do in a cinematic sense. So we're having fun with it right now, right? We're, we're we're teasing around, but it's it's very. I feel would feel bad blaming Lucas for that. He has a lot to be blamed, Jar Jar Binks and everything else. But it's certainly not for having realistic portrayals of intelligence, because even shows like Homeland don't do a good job. And people were asking what you would like to see coming up. So you've kind of answered that with. The Mandalorian's more steady approach, and I and someone commented that they've done recruitment of indigenous people more in the Mandalorian. Right. Well, they are they are apparently making a Cassian Endor series, 
or at least a prequel movie. So you're, you're going to find the actual intelligence officer, right? So maybe we learn a little bit about rebel intelligence training or, or how, you know, he doesn't just call himself an intelligence officer, we assume. We assume that he actually did something to become that. So maybe we'll see a little bit more about what is going on behind the scenes. Like, I know in the extended universe, whether it's the books or the non-canon books, there was conversation about, you know, more widespread intelligence. Um, but that's, you know, we're, we're sticking within the movies that everyone's seen and not necessarily the extended universe. And in that, it just doesn't exist. It's just hard to find. Um, this is a, a, a interesting perspective. Is there any way we can take away something done well from Star Wars? Oh, I mean, I think there's a lot done well. I think it's it's much easier to, to really hunker in on the, the failures, right? Because they're, they're just so impactful. Um, but I mean, the deception operation was, like I talked about, was genius. I mean, it's yeah. as good as it gets. You're really playing into the preconceived biases of the rebellion. You're going, you're hitting them where it hurts, right? Here's the emperor, come get me, right? Here's another Death Star, but it's not ready yet. You know, here's your chance. It's exactly what the rebels want to hear. And so they very easily fall into that trap. And of course, again, by killing the boffins, it makes it look like it was hard won information. That's a really good intelligence operation. Mm -hmm. Analytically, they actually do a pretty good job when it comes to understanding the weaknesses of the first Death Star, right? You know, I mean, yes, Galen or so kind of feeds them that, but they're able to analyze the information that comes in and understand exactly how to kill that Death Star. Um, the opposite happens in, in um, Force Awakens. They literally have no idea how to destroy a Starkiller base. Um, and, you know, Finn makes it up as he goes along, and that's just not how the Force works. Uh, and, and so that they get magic, magic out of that one, um, and it had nothing to do with good intelligence. Well, we got two final questions. Uh, I love this one. Would you consider the Empire in Spaceballs to have a better intelligence apparatus than the Empire in Star Wars? I thought you would enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, and the funny part is, absolutely. Right. I mean, if, you, if they're, they systematically comb the desert, you know, and they, they, they go through when they're searching for Lone Star and they're searching for Princess Vespa, they're systematic about it. They go and they do and they use their resources at their hand. They've got the VHS copy of Spaceballs are able to use for the ultimate imagery intelligence of actually finding out, you know, through the movie itself where they're actually looking for things. I mean, the analytical side, not so great. Dark Helmet, you know, not, not all that great for the analysis, but they certainly are taking it more seriously in many respects than the Empire does. It's a, it's a great question. All right, here's the last one. Um, would you be a rebel or are you part of the Empire, Vince? I think I would be, uh, well, I mean, I grew up wanting to be Luke Skywalker, but, you know, he got so whiny and, and it's really problematic. I, I think I'd probably be, you know, non aligned, right? A, a bounty hunter or someone that I don't like joining stuff. I'm not big with groups. Um, but, you know, I mean, to be honest, I, I'd probably be in the Empire. Uh, they had all the perks. They probably had better health care than the Rebellion did. You know, they much cooler uniforms. Um, and, you know, there are they're, they're people who survived. Right. I'm sure there's a good retirement plan. They don't necessarily have to die at the hands of the rebellion. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, it's hard to say, but I probably would have gone with the powerful. Well, I really liked uh, Kira's clothes in uh, she's in Crimson Dawn. I, I was going to wear this fur jacket and I forgot today. Well, it, it's, all, it's also a little warm. I was going to have the Wookiee, uh, the Chewbacca robe on, but I, you would have seen me passing out midway through to talk today so well we we wouldn't want that i can't thank you enough for doing that at lightning speed i really really appreciate that it's so fun um as we said to people it may be on our youtube channel we'll see what our our dear lawyer see what the lawyer with. says yeah we'll see what charles says and charles thank you thank you so much and uh and we appreciate our representative from the emperor going away with such good spirit. That was very unexpected. Um, uh, if you'd like to join us for a little more fun this week, we have trivia on Wednesday night at 5.30. Um, spy trivia, it's tough. And then Thursday evening, 
we're going to learn more about Sir Francis Walsingham and Queen Elizabeth, who he served as spy master. And then also, and then, you know, back to like hard boiled spy stories like the U2 spy plane shoot down next week. So you'll, you'll see Vince again, you'll see me again, and we hope we'll see you again and you'll stay well. Thanks so much, everyone. Do we say may the force be with you? You say may the fourth be with you if you really want, but. That's what we'll say. Everyone take care. Have a great night. Yay!